set the scene really. We have a pernicious problem that's affecting developed nations across the globe. And trade is being compromised, a lot of money is being lost to fraudsters, indeed it's feeding international criminal gangs. And ultimately it's causing problems to many people, millions of people, um, in terms of lost time and reputation. Um, and that certainly describes the situation regarding identity fraud. But it also describes the problem that this nation was, as a seeker of information, was suffering 300 years ago. I'm referring to the problem of determining where you are on the planet when all you can see around you is 360 degrees of clear blue ocean. And there are some parallels between the longitude problem and the identity problem we have today. Specifically, how you actually solve where you are requires two bits of information. Latitude, where you are on a north-south line, is relatively easy. You have Polaris, the star, you have measuring the angle from the sun to the uh, horizon at uh, noon and so on. Um, and that was easy for a while. But longitude was this sort of pernicious problem. It just wouldn't go away. It was really difficult. There was no heavenly reference point that you could just get a fix on and know where you are on, uh, on the east-west line. And this was really solved by seafarers at the time using something called dead reckoning. They'd work out what direction they're traveling in using a compass. they try and figure out their speed and they plot their position every day, and they'd add it up. And of course, that would also add up the errors. And the way they worked out the speed was by often chucking a log over the side and watching it recede into the distance. And then they'd, they'd figure out how long that took, and they'd get a rough idea of their speed. Uh, so dead reckoning was full of errors, and those errors compounded every day. And this wasn't just an abstract problem. This actually cost people their lives, because Either you'd be zigzagging across the sea for days, weeks, months, and your crew would start dying of uh, things like scurvy. Or you'd come across the Isles of Scilly of the night, and three naval vessels would be lost, um, and the overall with it. So you have the easily measured lost uh, cargo, lost ship, lost trade, um, and you have the crime and piracy angle, because of course, when they used to go around in those days, they used to stick to well-known, well-traveled shipping lanes. You know, they'd follow everybody about and not get lost. But of course, that means the pirates knew where they were too. So they jumped out on them. And this is rather like fishing today on the internet. You know which sites you go to. If you can mock up a site, you go, bang, oh, look, I've got your password. And that has to be the same password you use on your other sites as well. So that's really quite handy. Um, and of course, national security is affected and uh, uh, from from student and, and naval tragedies as I've indicated. And the response to this was the 1714 Longitude Act where somebody put up, the, well the government, uh, the Crown put up the princely prize of £20,000 for uh, somebody to fix this business of discovering the longitude of the sea. And um, in those days the establishment were essentially astronomers. They're the ones who held the purse strings and had all the positions of power in the, in the state. And there was this epic quest, this battle between the astronomers who figured out that really you can work out longitude just by doing what we do now with the stars but in the other direction. Okay, it's a bit more complicated. We have to have almanacs of numbers and tables as to where the stars are going to be on any particular date in the future. And it took a long time, decades actually, they planned to fix this problem by having all these almanacs that would be produced. Um, and then the other uh, camp were the horologists, the people who uh, figured, reckoned that you could create a, a clock that would uh, create a uh, key time of your port um, accurately as you travel the uh, ocean blue. And so if you knew the time where you left and you know that there are 24 hours in the day and so on, you can figure out where you are on east and west line quite accurately. The problem was that you couldn't make an accurate timepiece because you had you know, pendulums weren't too good on the tossing ocean, and you had uh, errors in terms of uh, you know, change of temperature as you moved into the tropics and so forth. So everyone went, oh, that's never going to work. 
And it's just like an insoluble problem. Like we'll, we'll never figure out how, how to get that longitude accurate. It's just one of those things we have to live with. And the same is thought somewhat about identity fraud today. We just have to live with it. You know, there are things you can do. You can shred all your rubbish, and you can change your password every day, and have it with uppercase letters, 18 characters, and all the rest of it. But, you know, it's just going to be something you're going to have to live with. But again, there are two axes on which you can fix identity. The first one is easy, rather like latitude. Which person are we dealing with on the planet? And so, how do we uh, how do we individuate that person? Well, I'm individuated quite ham, quite uh, easily by my name, and my address, and some people like to add date of birth on there as well. But that only really is needed if you need to resolve two people with the same name and the same address, which is pretty unusual. So that uh, I can use name and address and date of birth to individuate me uh, amongst the seven billion. But the other thing you need, of course, is a differentiator. How can you be sure that this Jeremy Newman isn't actually somebody pretending to be Jeremy Newman. How do you make sure that I'm not one of the other people on the planet? Um, and today's differentiators, we're all familiar with. Uh, way back when, I suppose, you know, 20, 30 years ago, 40 maybe, somebody had the bright idea of saying, well, we'll ask them what their mother's maiden name is, because nobody else is going to know that, right? Not in, not at home. So that didn't last long, so we came up with passwords and pins uh, secrets and pet names and the name of your first school and so on and so forth. So all these secrets aren't, aren't really effective either because of course you have to share them with the organisation that's then going to test you with them. Um, and then it's data again, data on documents in the form of passwords, uh, sorry, passports and driver's license, licenses. They're, they're all being forged on an industrial scale today and uh, you can get pretty much any, any set of documents for any country you want, uh, made for you. Uh, here, Spain is pretty active in this area for some reason. Um, and then, fourthly, the dongles. Um, this absurdity of distributing hardware, computers essentially, to your customer base. So that they can do something with the computer you give them, so they can do something with the computer you didn't give them, and so we're all monkeys typing numbers out of this machine and into this machine, and then that's supposed to resolve us, and that's supposed to differentiate us from all the other people on the planet. Well, that only works for so long. It's expensive, and these things run out of power and all the rest of it. So we're left with this identity fraud, eye wateringly big numbers of how much money is just lost to fraudsters. Um, in this country, 1.9 billion pounds, which we could all, I'm sure, do within the economy. Um, but that's only the tip of the iceberg because. It's actually the, uh, the, the, the actual victims, the people who actually become uh, a victim of identity fraud, uh, who actually are the canaries in the coal mine. In other words, banks do business, blah, 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 they put up all these procedures, it looks like it's all going to work fine, and they look like they're doing the right thing. But the consumer is the canary in the coal mine because they tell the bank when somebody's, you know, been messing with their account or has used their credit card. Um, and then you have the amount of money, because identity is broken in the same way that Longitude was broken 300 years ago, then we're spending 800 million pounds a year on cleanup, prevention and detection, and 16 billion in the States. And, the, uh, and obviously the losses are very high in the States because it's a large population, $37 billion each year. Um, just uh, last month, uh, CIFAS, which is the UK's fraud detection agency, um, did their annual, no, quarterly figures, and they uh, produce the stats on how much fraud is going up and down, and they, they reckon that um, straightforward identity fraud has gone up 40%, and what they call account takeover, which is where somebody just gets into your account, is gone up by 86% on a year-on-year -year basis. So we really have a situation where we're all trying to do commerce online, but it's like trying to fill a bath with a plug-out. You know, 1%, 2%, 3% of those transactions just get wasted, and people have to pick up the pieces. And so you can say it affects individuals because they have to put up all these phishing emails. Uh, there are markets out there with your information on. If you think your name isn't on a database for sale and your uh, social security number and your etc. etc., come see me afterwards because I'll find somewhere where you can buy it back. But they'll sell it to somebody else as well, of course. Um, you have the clean-up time it takes to repair your reputation. And the weird thing is, is 
Although we know that fraud represents only a tiny slice of the overall transactional pie, the vast majority, the instant majority, are having to jump through hoops to explain who they are, prove who they are, fish out documents, fish out pins and passwords and fake names and so forth, to prove who they are to banks. So the innocent majority is putting in all the effort, and the fraudsters go, well, we can do that too. So, you know, knock yourself out. And we need to turn this thing upside down, or inside out at least. And the response to identity fraud thus far, from the state at least, is not to have a fantastic prize that everyone can go put in their minds and intelligence to, but they come up with this idea of centralising identity in the state, 2006 identity card, God knows what they were trying to fix, pretty much everything you can think of, including identity fraud, terrorism, illegal immigration, and so on. And the government, bless them, spent £330 million pounds on this. I think they spent £41 million, pounds, yeah, just £41 million pounds just on the policy and what they call the business model. I mean, £41 million pounds on policy, what are we going to do? And business model, who are we going to pay for it? Um, don't get me started. Well, I've got myself started. So, an, an epic fail, I would call that. We're still where we were, we're all poorer, and as I say, there's this underlying weakness, a kind of cancer which is stopping all this going anywhere. So, there's a single cause of identity fraud. Anyone care to throw out what it might be? Okay, so identity fraud happens when a, an individual is doing business with some other party an organisation. Well, the single cause of identity fraud is that organisations don't know people. Sometimes they can't even see them, right? They can maybe hear them on the telephone, and sometimes they can neither see or hear them, if it's over the internet. But even if they're stood there in the back, they don't know who they are. Uh, there was an example of somebody who had a credit card taken out in their name, in Bark a Barking Card, actually it was. I can name it, because it's a public story. Um, and then uh, they went into the branch, of Barclays, and took out £10,000 under this guy's name. And the irony is that the person whose identity was stolen and used to access his own account was a guy called Marcus Aegis, who is the chairman of Barclays Bank. So, even their own people they don't know. <laughs> oh dear. So, there is a solution out there, there is a basis, and we have to look at the facts, and the facts are that we spent uh, millennia of... Uh, uh, evolution, finally tuning our uh, ability to recognise people. It's a matter of uh, life or death. Our very survival depends on it. Um, it has done. Friend from foe. And the second truth is, of course, is that nobody is who they say they are. People are only who other people say they are. So you get born, you get given a name, and you may change your name, but you're known by your nickname, or whatever it is. But basically, your identity is ecstatic comes from outside the person, it's bestowed on you by other people. And the problem that we've had all this time is that organisations have been bestowing identity on you. You know, this is your credit card number and you must remember this secret parcel will be phone us up and ask us some information about it. So the customer interface is traditionally seen as, on one hand you have people, and on the other hand you have organisations, and identity and data flies up and down this route. But that's not really how it is. The reality is, is that you have organisations and you have people, but identity happens between people. Organisations are not competent to do identity, because they don't have ideas and brains. I suppose this is a bit of a course analysis, but this is how we see it. And what's changed over the past few years is we've entered this world of hyper-connectivity. Everybody be, can be connected to everybody else at any time, at the drop of a hat. So, we're not just talking about telephones like have existed for decades and decades, but video chat, free and easy and so forth. So you have this incredible sensory input um, and feedback, very rich set of data. So the internet is essentially very quietly, while we've not been looking, grown eyes. So if you buy a laptop today, the very high probability is it's got a camera on it, because it only costs pence to add a, a camera to a laptop. And you try buying a phone these days that hasn't got a camera on particularly a smartphone, and the estimates of how many smartphones are going to be around, you know, in five years' time, it's five point five billion or something ridiculous, something that's just huge growth because everyone's going to have, the personal future is now in the phone, is, is in your pocket as a phone. And if you add to that the fact that people are starting to use uh, social paradigms of actually interacting on these things, uh, then we have an opportunity to use 
not what people know, but what people can do with their ability to recognise people that they know, and more importantly, reject the people they don't know. So we have redefined fraudsters here as people who are not recognised by the friends and family of their victim. So the answer to stopping fraud is somebody who you know looks at the person who's going to be you and goes, who the hell is that? So going back to that deep blue ocean of internet commerce, you have you, the little red dot, and around you, you have a load of people, I mean, you know who they are, who know what you look like. I mean, just think for a minute, how many people know what you look like? How many people could actually pick you out across the room or across the bed or on the telephone within half a syllable and say, hi? Oh, I... Yeah? I mean, you know, we're just extraordinarily well adapted to know who we're talking to when we're talking to the people we know. And then, of course, there's all that meta information, like what we have for breakfast and whether I park a car and where we go on holiday next week. The stuff which you don't have to share with your bank, but of course you both know. Um, so our, our vision of how identity should be done for the 21st century is not to detect all customers and have them follow processes and procedures and remember information and keep dongles with them and all this kind of stuff, but to detect all the fraudsters. To find them as people who are just unrecognised by the family circle, as it were, and boot them out. So we are defining everybody who isn't you. So not identity. It's the inverse of identification. I'm going to stop there and see if there are any questions, because so far it's just been concept, 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 and now I'm going to be talking about how we actually implement this thing. But has anyone got any issues with what I've said so far in terms of where identity comes from and how it works? No, of course not, because like, it works, right? You don't go around with badges saying, hello, I'm your wife. So, two sides to this uh, problem. There's the consumer-facing side and the business-facing side. That's the nature of the beast. So, we envisage a map of the ability to recognise across the entire population. Okay? The ability to recognise other people. A registry, if you like. And the, this ability to recognise can be donated by people to help the people they care about. So you're not doing this for you know, everybody, you're doing it for the people you care about. So this also goes to the motivation here. Because let's face it, most of us don't care about the big picture of identity fraud. They don't care about the $37 billion. They don't care about the 1.8 million pounds or whatever. They care about, it doesn't happen to them, that's what they care about. And they care about, it probably doesn't happen to their immediate family, that's what they care about. But everyone else can just like, whatever, walk off a cliff. So, essentially, to map the population, we need a social graph in the vernacular of Facebook, but it's one which is dedicated for the single purpose of proving who you're not, essentially. And to build this graph, we're going to use, essentially, social collaboration. So it's people helping one another out in a very loose sort of sense. Um, and it has to be done in a very careful and careful order, because you can't just let everybody just say, oh, hey, here's a photograph make it a plane. You have to build this thing out in the same way that it would be built out if you walked into a party for the first time. You've never been there, you didn't know anybody. Like me, for instance. Right? I mean, Steve says I'm Jeremy Newman, but how do you know? So, we have to cross-verify one another's visual representation. So we have at least one photo. That is the propagation method we're using at the moment. You can optionally add video recordings to this thing. And we don't just stick up a photograph and is this Jeremy Newman and you go, yeah. You don't have a button that says yes. We don't want to leave the witness at all. So it's very important that the system that's looking at people, because again, this is like computer vision essentially, can determine whether or not the person who is online is able to do something without leaving the witness. So we do a lineup, uh, three by three grid of photographs. Do you recognize anybody here? And if you do, you click on the photo you know, and then you put in, you know, again, you've got a multiple choice. Do you know any of these, you know, is it one of these first names, is it one of these last names? Now, this is a can demo, I'm sorry guys, because it is a bit of a hurry. Women, men's name, doesn't normally happen that way, okay? <laughs> but the important thing here is, if you don't recognise anybody, you click on that link saying, I don't recognise anyone here. And that's how identity fraud is stopped. Okay? Now, I'll show you how this will work in the live setting. Um, 
But some rules first, plotting this map. First off, it's done by invitation only. And the person who invites you, you have to recognize them. You have to recognize your inviter. And when you've done that correctly, using that recognized gesture I was talking about, you have to do the same in reverse. So you get to upload your photograph if you recognize me, and then I have to recognize you in the same kind of uh, multiple choice kind of way. At the moment, we've got my photographs, 10 first names, 10 last names. I guess there's a of, what is it, 900 chance that you could actually get it by accident. But that's not really the point here. Um, and when you've done that, you then have to specify how you're going to be looked up. Because right? there's no point having a map if you've got to navigate it. Right? And, and the individuator is how you navigate it. So when somebody walks into a bank branch and claims this name and address, then it's my membership we're talking about. Okay? So you look up using individuators, and you obtain differentiation, so that the organization this is can actually differentiate the person who stood there from all the other people on the planet, either by calling up on the reference media, which has been cross-verified by your present family, or by actually calling up on the referees themselves. So to summarize, well, I'll come back to that in a minute, actually. It's better we get to the example. So the subject makes an identity claim. This is a bank branch, right? And the bank teller doesn't know who they're doing today. And rather than the, uh, the subject on the other side fishing out a photograph on a piece of plastic or a piece of paper or anything like that, their photograph from this system would appear on the display. So you know how photo ID works. Well, imagine that working in a digital sense. So it's not on a piece of plastic that's got the last 10 years or a, or a, a specially laminated and holographed piece of paper, fantastic stuff. It's actually on a server somewhere, which is much harder to fraud. Plus the fact you have more than one photo. Oh, and they're not just one inch square. They can be blown up onto a, onto a screen, zoomed in on someone. So it's actually a better form of photo ID. So that's the start, right? Okay, so we've got people vouching for one another out there in the community. It's a fairly tightly bound network. Um, it's hard to parachute into the middle of that as an identity fraud server unless you think you can convince my mum that you and me, which is hard. Um, and, and then you've got the photo the reference photo that's been vouched for. Um, but, uh, according to some research that was done out of Glasgow University, where they tested people's ability to compare photos of people they don't know, which is what security guards do, right? People aren't very good at it. People are really bad, actually. They're about 20, in fact, it's, they might as well just be tossing a coin, because they're just bad at comparing photos of people they don't know. Um, so what the security guard does when they get a photo driver's license or a passport chucked in their face, or this bank teller gets a photo fished out of a, uh, a wallet or whatever, nobody knows. No guess, I guess. So we don't think that's very good. But it, we're doing this because it just is the way the world likes to see things happen at the moment. A better way is more of an outsourced way of doing it. The photo um, of the person stood there in the branch is captured and sent into the network. And one of your identity referees, or her identity referees in this case, is found online, or they have a phone in their pocket, and they go through that same photo thing, and they hit the button saying this is who it is, or they hit the button saying this is a fraudster, and the parcel fail is then returned to the screen. So essentially you then have a system where you can outsource to people who actually know whether this person is a fraudster or not, in real time, while you're doing the transaction. Um, I'm just going to get back to that uh, summary slide, uh, just to compare the old model of identity, how we're doing things today, where you vouch for yourself, you know, you have all the information you need in order to prove to the dark police branch in town that you are you. Unfortunately, so does everybody else. Um, in the new model, you don't vouch for yourself, other people vouch for you, and you vouch for other people. And the difference is, is that under today's world, anybody else can be you, right? Anybody else can be you because they just need to know some information, some demographics, or they fished a password, or they've guessed it. You know, the, you know the story about the common top ten passwords, you know, password, one, two, three, four, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so what we're trying to do is create a world where nobody else can be you because we're using uh, the sensory devices of um, seven billion people and four or five millennia of evolution to bring to bear on the task. Right? No hardware required. Well, certainly not. So we're moving for a world from identifying every customer to detecting every fraudster. Just getting back through that. Um, 
Any questions so far? Yeah. If I've understood this properly, um, uh, it, it relies on people telling the truth. And it, it, um, I, I don't see where um, you know, collusion might, might occur if, if I wanted to say that Steve was in fact someone else. Yeah, because we were this, colluding. Th that, that question is the one that comes out every time. Because what you're assuming is that we're trying to do the same thing that all the other identity systems have done to date. But remember, we're inverting the problem. So there is nothing to be done with collusion in this model. I'll tell you why. Because the system doesn't assert identity, it excludes identity. So it'd be rather like colluding to get somebody into strange ways. Right? There'd be no point in doing it. There's no mileage in, I mean, there are, you can have synthetic identities on our system. We don't think it's even worth getting rid of those. I mean, there will be a problem for certain relying parties. But if you want to call yourself Cornelius Wells Wrangler and get yourself invited under that and find a friend who's going to vouch you as Cornelius Wells Wrangler, then you can go around and nobody else can be Cornelius Wells Wrangler. Good for you. If you want to be somebody else, right, who already is called you as well, Strangler, this is a bad example to use. All right. If you want to be somebody else in our system, there's, there's two circumstances, there's two um, situations that can, that can happen with you. One is this person is already a member of ID Angels. Sorry, I haven't mentioned even the brand names yet, but someone is already on the network. If they're already on the network and they've registered their name and address and they've got their photos and all the rest of it, then you can't parachute in there and just take their identity over. Right? Because we don't allow two people with the same name to be on the database at the same time. Right? So we can handle the takeover sense within our network. If, somebody, if you want to be somebody who isn't a member of our network, then good luck to you. Because we only protect people who are in our network. And if you're a fraudster, you'd be better off not joining the network at all. Why? Because you have to put your photo on here in order to pass the bank test when you get to the bank and they fish up your photo. So there's a massive deterrent because you have to put your face on there. Plus the fact, if you're just not a member, if the person you're trying to defraud isn't a member of this system, then you have everything you need today to go and defraud them. Well, there's maiden name, passwords, passports, forwards, this, that, and the other. Okay. So the collusion thing is, I know where you're going with that, but in actual fact, we're not... I mean, somebody says, what happens if the Mafia do this? You know, what happens if the Mafia joins? Well, the Mafia could join, and they'd be extraordinarily well protected from identity fraud. But they wouldn't actually be able to be anybody else. I like, like this. Okay, so, so this table represents all 7 billion people on the planet, right? Um, and this dot here is you. And today, we know that that dot there is instantly replicable by the dint of somebody who's just wanted to do it. Right? There's nothing actually stopping them because of knowledge. What we're saying is, is that we can make that dot completely different from every other dot according to these other people in the, in the population. And that's how, that's how it works today. I hope I've answered that. <laughs> we'll come back to that one, no doubt. Okay, so, um, so obviously it's fine to think of this and just bring it, you know, to build it, but you've got to do two things. You've got to establish the ability to recognize the pop across the population. But it's not good enough. You have to have people who are willing to do it. Right? So it's a lot to do with motivation and people really caring about each other. So I wouldn't be an ID angel for any of you guys because I just don't know you. I mean, I can invite you onto the system. Believe me, I will. If you want, just give me a card or just give me a name and I'll send you an invitation. Um, but, you know, it's, 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 I, I don't unhook you sooner or later. Um, Suffice it to say that we have the, the opportunity at this point in time, just as everything's starting to swirl around rather violently, to have people gain control of identity. And it's, it's really once in a lifetime. I mean, you know that the forces of evil out there are ready to stick you all on a centralised register and charge you £35 for the privilege and encourage you by giving you a £2,000 fine if you don't join up. Okay. Well, I didn't think much of that. You know, I was born in a world where 
I was studying things like Brave New World and Mice 84 and Lawn of the Flies, and it frightens me slightly to think that identity shouldn't be owned by people. All right, so we have to grab this thing. You know, we're in this whirlpool. We're going down the digital drain. Things are getting faster and faster. And you've seen things like Facebook grow, and everyone's kind of getting used to this vernacular of being instantly contactable. Um, and so you can either do it this way, or you can just trust some <coughs> government organization to do it for you. But it, we know that doesn't work already. Um, anyway, so for what it's worth, you know, we have built a business to actually try and uh, create this person-centric, human-centric way of doing identity in the real world, but doing it online. So the, 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 the uh, social graph that we're building is called ID Angels. Um, and we call it that really because it is about you protecting other people. We, or rather, we figured it would be better to positioning it as you protecting other people. Although in reality it's a mutual system. They have to protect you as well, right? Um, and so that's free, free to consume, of course. Um, on the other side of the fence, so we've got that's the business to consume. On the other side of the fence, we've got um, how do you deliver this to organizations. Um, and we're doing this through a separate organization uh, called Reality Check. That's how we pronounce it. So organizations get the Reality Check. Um, and they do it through an API, Web Services API, which allows them to either pull down the reference media of the member or um, send in media and have it compared. Um, we actually have an app at the moment called Glass Flipper that runs on Android. So you take a photograph of somebody with your phone um, and you submit it to Reality Check. And if that photograph is of you, it's a demonstrator, right? It's not actually doing anything particularly serious. Um, you take, take a photograph and send it into the network. And if that photograph is of you, it reports the shoe fits in the Cinderella 6. And if it's of somebody else or anything else, it reports, ugly sister, all right? And in actual fact, the way this one is actually plumbed in at the moment is that we send the reference photograph and the one that's just taken from the mobile into what's called the Amazon Mechanical Turk. Has anyone heard of that thing? Yeah, well it's basically, it's an online workforce of people who do arbitrary tasks for small amounts of money. So, you know, there's all kinds of things where people use it to find out blogs are properly written or advertising are correctly positioned or whatever. We happen to use it to get people to uh, compare photographs. And so they get the two photographs and they set a slider essentially, you know, these two photographs are the same person, these two photographs are different people, or it's not a photograph of a person, or I'm going to give up now because I'm too bored or whatever. So in the middle is like, I can't really work it out. Um, but it's quite interesting because it always works. You know, we're, th there are people out there who can do this comparison thing very well. They're called super recognizers, I believe. Uh, they're just attuned to it. They're out there. So we put this together in a uh, Montesquieu's separation of power sense by saying that you have um, identity by the people, the, um, the legislature for this identity system, who people who actually are um, setting the rules and joining the system. Um, identity of the people is obviously what uh, organisations are interested in, so that's what's supplied through the, um, through the web services API. And we figured that in the middle there, there was going to be need, uh, a requirement for a, a, a judiciary, if you like. Because these two other organisations are in conflict, so there is a conflict of interest potentially. Um, so looking down the road away, we can see that there's a need for a, um, an arbitrating body to resolve these conflicts in, in, in the middle, uh, which we call the ID mean. And that's where we just chuck our wiki at the moment. Um, so, gosh, what was that? Um, we call it P2P identity, peer-to-peer -peer identity. The same, we've probably heard of companies like Zopa who do peer-to-peer -peer lending. Well, this is peer-to-peer -peer identity. It's a fact of life that we have this hyper-connectivity. Um, we have all this technology around us, so we're just getting into this business of actually using natural identity uh, online. Um, and so our mission is to essentially build an identity meridian in the same way that there's a Greenwich meridian, uh, but it's an identity meridian that passes through each one of us. And uh, as I said earlier, we either do this and get it right, or we're on a slippery slope uh, as far as identity goes. I mean, we know we're on the slippery slope because of the amount of money we're actually wasting on it today. Any questions?
questions? Any more questions? Um, I don't think we go back to that pool one, then. Yeah, uh, Yeah, um, I don't quite understand. So the main part of this technology is that whenever you say go to your bank and ask to do something, a sort of verificate, uh, what, uh, uh, an associate of yours is asked to verify that uh, you. Well, in, in, in that's one particular manifestation of it. So um, there's one ID angels for the planet. So that's the social graph. You join up, you invite your friends and family. And you do that once, and then you're pretty much done with it. You don't keep coming back to the site. It's not social networking. In fact, if it were a social network, it's kind of weird, because the profiles aren't made public. And you can't see the profiles of, your, of the people who invited you. Either. I think that's the perfect type of social Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Okay. I mean, like, we're, we're actually... I'm not even a member of Facebook, okay? I, I mean, I, I read their privacy policy, I went, no, it's not for me, all right? And, 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 and then I built this. So you can be sure that, that we have been hyper aware of, of, of privacy concerns. For instance, right, the reason for this separation of powers, the church and state, it's important that people who are doing refereeing aren't known to the organisation who's requiring refereeing. It's also important that people who are doing a referee don't know the nature of the transaction that's being conducted. Right, so if you go and buy a car, you don't want anyone to know you're buying a car, but you do want to have them protect you from somebody else buying a car on your name, right? Getting a lease out, for instance, out of uh, Lloyd's TSP or whatever. Um, so, okay, so you've got ID Angels, one of those, and several reality checks in different countries. So somebody right now could be walking into a bank, well not right now, okay, they're shut, but a bank in Leicester, right, and could be giving your name and address over and opening an account, or opening your account, who knows, you know, account takeover, as like I said earlier. So in order to stop that happening, we need to help organisations know who they're dealing with, because they have no clue. So one, they can actually call up the reference photograph that you've had people vouch for you through, that's one. Or audio recordings or video recordings, but let's say just photos for the moment. Two, they can send a photograph that they've captured of this person who stood in that branch into the network, and at that point we say, is anyone online who is one of the, this person's identity referee, referees, and if they've got a phone in their pocket or if there's a, they've sat there at a computer and they're logged on, then something will ping, and then they can do that photo lineup again. Actually, that's the bit I was wondering about because, in the worst case scenario, yes. what if no one was on the network at the time? Then the worst case scenario is that they only get the photograph. Right. <laughs> yeah. Or they use the Amazon account for service, right, super yeah. comparator. That's because, what I wanted to know. Yes, because yes. in between, you see, we have we have to change the world here, okay? Because organisations feel responsible. We do identity, you know. This is our problem. In actual fact, they're crap at it, right? So they need help. All right. But it'll take them a while to say, all right, well, we'll just allow identity to be outsourced rather than being our domain. Um, so, you know, in between them having the photograph so that their agent sat at the bank teller window is responsible for looking at the person looking at this photograph, which we know doesn't work, and getting what we call a live refereeing session going where somebody who actually knows you personally goes, oh, look, there's John, right? There's the middle bit, which is where they send a photograph out that they've captured, and it's compared by people who don't know you, but they just happen to do a better job than the teller who isn't trained or skilled or doesn't know what they're doing. So in other words, it's a sort of layered approach? Yeah, exactly. And it's partly to do with um, technology and the cost, you know, the economic viability of it, and it's also partly to do with accepted practices, which is, you know, the bank for what photographs to look at. And it's not just banks either. Um, well, actually, we skid through here a bit. Um, there's some examples here of simple face-to-face -face settings. As I said, there are only three ways that, customers, that organizations can interact with you, face-to-face, -face, over the phone, or over the web. There aren't any others. Well, maybe you borrow a piece of paper in the mail, but you know, we won't call that one. Um, so face-to-face -face is obviously our strong suit, because we're dealing with eyes and ears. Right? And there's some good instances where you could be a victim of identity fraud right now. Somebody could be buying a phone in your name or renting a car or whatever. Because really what they're trying to do is gain access to your resources. And a resource might be your bank account, but it could equally be your credit rating. But it could also be your ability to vote, which has got nothing to do with money. So we want to develop a system which is open to everybody, regardless of their wealth or status. 
This is nothing to do with credit reference agencies. Although credit reference agencies will sell you identity theft insurance, and they reckon they do identity, which they do in a sense, but they're part of the problem rather than part of the solution. Um, picking up the package from lost and found, or going to a parcel depot, opening and closing the bank account, changing the address. So there's a major locus of identity fraud right there, because they change the address and then apply for a car. Um, so the phone situation is in face to face. The phone situation is a bit of a weird one. I mean, we know how that would work, but it's always and strange uh, compared to what you're used to doing today. But online, when you can neither see or hear the person you're dealing with, then we think that's, that's a just, you can't do anything. So our vision for how you will do serious high gravity transactions in the future, like I want to send 10,000 pounds from my account to this account in Nigeria, just a second, all right, your webcam is going to burst into life, and you're going to have a window there, and somebody's going to pop into that window, and it's going to be somebody you know. You're going to hide friend, hi Jim, and you both identify each other, click, and then you're done. Somebody out there has actually paid, that's Jim, and they've gone ahead with it like that. So our vision of how online stuff will happen is actually using, using the webcam. Um, sure, yeah. What about um, facial recognition software? Yeah, that's the software that measures the width between your eyes. And so on, yeah, facial features. Great. Um, under the category biometrics, I mean, I ran a biometrics company for 10 years, between 1990 and 2000. And at the end of all that, the stunning revelation was that the best biometrics on the planet are people, hence the title of the presentation. Right. Duh, you know, we spent all our life on algorithms and measuring this, that, and the other, and tiny little ridges and all this sort of business, when really people do it in a heartbeat. Now, having said that, there are some things which biometrics are better at than people, and that's speed. Right? Because if I'm going to have to get some, I mean, it sounds a lot today, I'm going to get somebody who's out there and they're online, they've got to look at my photograph and I'm trying to do something in the bank, it's all going to take far too long. Well, it won't, because let's face it, you know, it takes a while to do anything at all at the window. By the time you've done your thing at the window, you've probably been verified. But um, if, if you like, this map is essentially building a, uh, a substrate of digital identity, of truth, right? Because this is who you are. You are who other people say you are. Now, that substrate, if you so wish, right, hence the, you know, ID Angels being the legislature, if you so wish, that substrate could be used by accelerators like facial recognition. So the question is that we answer, to what do you compare? So there are banks out there who are doing voice verification, for example. And when you open an account with them, they have you do the things on the phone, you've got to repeat the phrase three times, and they enroll your voice, and then next time you call them up, you say something or whatever, and then they verify your voice. So it's like the same sort of thing, but voice. Um, and that's fine, but of course you then have to do the same thing with another bank or another institution. So, you know, you build up these biometric templates everywhere we go. Well, what our vision is simply have one place where you curate your photo, voice, video, and that's yours. And then everyone else can access that in order to protect you from impersonation. But for no other purpose. You know, we don't want this to be used for marketing. That's why the chances are ID Angels will end up in a not-for-profit or a mutual or a cooperative. Cooperative is interesting, as is mutual, because of course, you know, you might, well, we're playing with the business model, but we could even make it so that, you know, you actually are um, essentially renting out your photograph to the organisation that needs to know who you are. Um, yeah, did that answer your question? So yes, face, face, face recognition is fine, but you, you do the comparison against something you know to be true. Um, furthermore, just to add, while someone may know that you might get, hopefully not a disfiguring uh, feature, but yeah. otherwise facial recognition is not going to work like that. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think I know where you're going with that. I mean. If you do change your appearance, like you shave the beard off, or you dye your hair blue, or you have a Mohican, um, then you take another photograph and you stick it on ID Angels, and you get and your friends, every time you add a new photograph, your friends are asked to look at it again in the grid. And if they know what you really look like, then they'll just be able to do the same thing. If they don't know you, then they don't know you. Um, yeah. By that, by what you just said there, would you then hold previous photos yeah. to get a better match of changes over time, or would it be just point in time? Right. Um, no, we are only interested in what people look like right now, uh, because it's the future transactions 
that we're trying to prevent you being impersonated within. So it's important that we have a current and up-to-date photograph. It's in your interest as a member of ID Angels to keep your photograph up to date. Why? Because if you don't, and you grow that beard, you're going to go into the bank, they're going to go, get out of here. Right? So it's in your interest to maintain your appearance. I try that with your driver's license photograph. You've got to go and spend whatever they, what do they charge now for a photograph? Uh, passports, 90 pounds or something? Yeah. And driver's license is? Who needs that? You should be paid. You should be paid every time you're identified. That's how we see it. I mean, this is how the world works now, isn't it? Everything's either free or they pay you to do it. For real. <laughs> What's wrong with that? You know, because it's a transaction which is the bank is dependent on. You should be paid because you, with your eyes and ears, are providing identification products and services to organisations. Products in the form of media, photographs, audio recordings, video recordings, and services by, you know, taking the effort to pull your phone out of the pocket and go, yeah, I know that guy. Yeah, but what about human emotion? Yeah, I know that guy, but he annoyed me yesterday, it's not. Right, well that's the thing. That's why it's been difficult developing this thing. It sounds easy enough, you know, we just need people here, but it's actually taken us four years to build this stupid graphing system, right? And that's because, you know, somebody asked that question four years ago. So what happens if I divorce? You know, or I just fall out? You know, and we go, oh God, we didn't think of it. <laughs> so we then have to build a system which actually allows you to prune your list of referees. And you can do that. So you have a list of referees on Variety Angels, and you can prune it. Um, but so that we don't allow fraudsters who have happened to have found out your Variety Angels password, the ability to rip off your set of referees and put in their co-conspirators, we only allow you to do one every 24 hours, or something like that. So we actually say, yes, you know, okay, well, we're going to delete this person. You'll get an email between more than 23 hours later, and then you get that number, and you put it into the system, and there it goes. But, so we actually throttle that. Um, but yeah, we absolutely have to recognise the fact that somebody who you have previously relied on to identify you may, long, may no longer be reliable. But bear in mind, the worst that they can do is to stop a transaction happening, right? Which is better than the situation today. They can't do a transaction in your name, right? Because all the other friends that you've got will actually stop them impersonating you. <laughs> You know, there's another slightly serious side to this as well. Um, one of the great areas of identity fraud is deceased person fraud, where somebody figures out somebody's died, so they quickly go and apply for those credit cards and their names. Right? Well, I knew that my mother died well before Xperia and Equifax did. I knew straight away. So you don't need to wait for eight databases to be updated by somebody who can't stuff in. You'd have to make all those business and phone things. This is the beauty of the system, right? When you actually start to use people to do identity, which is what they do today and every day, then you don't need passwords, you don't need months making names, you don't need pins, you don't need dongles, you don't need card readers, you don't need biometric anything. You just be yourself. End of problem. It's quite interesting actually if you look at the way biometrics have developed because it's rather like when you use a microscope, you know, when you put your specimen on the slide and you put it on the least magnification first so you can sort of see where your thing is and then you crank in the photo focus and then you crack up the, the magnification and you end up going to the maximum magnification, right? Well, biometrics is rather like starting on that maximum magnification to start off with. We're going to look at fingerprints, we're going to look at RS pattern scans, we're going to check out your vein patterns on the back of your hand, all this sort of stuff, your ear shape your gait, um, all those weird and wonderful things, which is fine. I mean, there's data out there. <laughs> DNA, great. You know, that's definitely good, isn't it? The trouble is, is that it's not human. You know, I, I don't know people by their fingerprints for us, eh? And that's important when it comes to what? Anyone? Justice. Right? You're going to go into court? You're going to bear witness? <coughs> You're not going to wield out an algorithm. Well, I'm sure there's some people who are prepared to do that, but it'll take months of testimony, and I'll probably shut down the flames. I saw it, you know, and that's, that's how it works today. So, it's, you know, it's also a question of saying, well, sooner or later, all this digital stuff going on, someone's going to bang me up on the basis of binary data. I'm not too pleased on that, you know. But that's, that's the curtain, that's the roof we have to cross. Yeah, so we've got to have some people in there with us, right? Not just algorithms, not just hardware and software. Yeah? Where's the data store? Okay, good question. 
it's just like any other data really. You know, we store it in a database, it's secure, it's encrypted, we use SSL on everything going between the, you know. Yeah, but where? Where? Right. The IBM Angel server is in the UK, and the reality check servers are in the US at the moment, in New Jersey. Um, we had a decision about two years ago as to which data privacy regime we were going to live up to. Were we going to go to the States where it's all like whatever, you know, or were we going to do it in Europe where they're super keen on everything? We did it in Europe. We thought we might as well start and develop this thing under the most strict uh, privacy regime. I know they're going a bit over the line a bit now, but that's what we did. And we spent an awful lot of money with lawyers. And we had some arguments because we had to do some things, you know, like for instance, we don't want to lead the witness. We want them to be contacted out of the blue and go, oh look, you know, there's Jim in this thing. I mean, I'll show you an example of an email, if I can. Um, I'll just get some emails from the ID Angels Registrar um, so you can see what an invitation looks like. And of course, the invitation is a tricky bit because sending email unsolicited is not supposed to happen, right? See, after you've actually joined the network, you don't actually get um, picture emails, you just get reminders. But this is the kind of thing you get. Okay, so someone wants to batch, wants you to batch for a photo, um, some blurb here saying what we do, and and then down here we have a link to go to the site. But if you don't like that, then you can go copy and paste and stick in this magic number. Um, now I happen to know that we use the um, population of Fort Baxter, otherwise known as Sergeant Bilker, uh, as our test set. So it'll be the black and white one in this case, in this test set. But um, you can't send an email unsolicited under EU data protection uh, uh, regulations. So um, we have to ask the person who's a member of ID Angels who's inviting somebody, have you got permission to send this email? They go, yeah, and then we're all right. Uh, but of course, when you get the email, the first thing you see here is a big load of opt-out language at the top saying how you can actually get out of this system if you're not interested. <laughs> and then down here we have loads of link, uh, links to actually opt out as well. Um, and then when you get to the opt-out page, um, we have to work out a way we can opt out and opt back in again. In other words, the first person who invites you to uh, be their ID angel, right, might not be somebody you want to do it for, in which case you can just duck. Um, but the second person you can, uh, you, you, you can take up. And then you think, actually, I should have done it for the first person too. And so how do we actually now pick that one? So we've got all the code in there so you can actually then invite somebody you previously blocked uh, by simply inviting them. Okay, so that's what that looks like. It's, it's interesting because, you know, you develop these sort of new ways of looking at things and you have to work out how to visualize it. I mean, it, it, answering your question is the toughest thing we've had to do. You know, what if a fraudster gets on this thing? Um, always asked. And, you know, it's... It's really tricky developing the language to do that. Um, I've mentioned already the business that we don't assert identity, we exclude identity. And you're only going to identify the people you know, because you can't do it any other way. Um, I've mentioned the, the, the condition where somebody is already a member of ID Angels. Well, what we actually do is that we suspend both accounts. So, okay. Mr. Smith, John Smith, is a member of ID Angels. He's got his family doing this thing, and he's forgotten about it, and it was a year ago. And along comes the fraud and says, well, I want to be John Smith at 123 Acacia Avenue. So John Smith finds a conspirator who's already a member of ID Angels, and presumably under their own name, to vouch for him as John Smith. But the minute he goes to step three, which is adding his own individuator, he's going to put in John Smith 123 Acacia Avenue. We go, hold everything. Right? So we freeze both accounts, because as a program, we don't know whether the good guy got in first or the fraudster got in first. So is this the good guy coming in now to rescue his solid reputation on ID Angels so he can get things back to rights? Because the great thing about this network, ID Angels, is that once you're in, nobody else can be you. Right? So... We suspend the accounts and then we invite both parties, because we've got two email addresses, to say, do you know the password of the other account? Because you might have just done this by accident. So if they know the password of the other account, then fine, we just merge them. So we have to at least start with the business of this might be an innocent mistake. The next thing we do is say, okay, well that didn't work, you haven't got any passwords to offer us. We, each, but we ask both of them to pay a deposit and then we'll write them a letter. 
and the first one to get the letter, will only be one of them because it's going to one address, the same address, um, they enter it into Archangels, and then we know who is the real one. But we haven't had to send letters to everybody who joins ID Angels, right? And moreover, the fraudsters probably won't bother putting in the five because they know they're not going to get it back again. Whereas the real guy, when they put a number in, we give them their five back. So they don't actually cost anything. If somebody's, a, it's, you know, you can be a fraudster on ID Angels, it's just going to cost you money, basically. Until you get squeezed out like a pit from a lever. Um, so that's what I call why, that's what the resolution is. And of course, if you're defrauding somebody and you are the fraudster and you're the first person onto the system, uh, the first thing we say is, is that you've got to upload a photograph of yourself, otherwise you're not going to be able to pass that check when you do uh, show up at the bank. So, fairly good deterrent there. You need to find somebody who's in the network under their real name to conspire with. That's a problem for them as, you, as well as you, because we have all this stuff logged, so we know when someone's actually con committing conspiracy, which at least under UK law has extra nasty legal consequences. And, um, and ultimately, as I say, a round trip uh, results. But today, at least, or at least initially, you know, there's no advantage for a fraudster to, to expose themselves by becoming a member of ID Angels because the person they're trying to defraud as a non-member can be defrauded already using all that mother's maiden name rubbish. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Um, going, going back to your analogy of uh, latitude. Yeah. Latitude? Lat well, longitude, longitude is sorry. the problem, yeah. Um, uh, how, how does the system cope with um, time zones? Like, if all your identifiers are here, yeah. and you travel to Australia to hire a car, yeah. or whatever, and then well, all the identifiers here will be sort of woken up in the middle of the night or, no. or whatever. No, um, because when your, when your referees aren't available online, then we just pull back to the photographs. So somebody trying to defraud you at least have to resemble you. That's the best we can do, really. Or we use this mechanical turk business. You know, we get we get people who are volunteers, essentially, in, members of ID Angels can volunteer to compare photographs of people they don't know. But, um, but is there some sort of mechanism that trips off the fact that um, you know, if you're at a desk and you see someone, yeah. and they have to say, well, actually, all my identifiers are in another time zone, could you use another system? You know, or, yeah, or does well, it automatically trigger off to go to your identifiers first of all? Yes, I mean, I, I think that we, we don't actually record the time zone of you as a referee. We just record whether you're online. And if you're online, then you're, you're, you're asked to do a reference. And if you don't respond to that reference, then you are offline, essentially, as far as we're concerned. So we will certainly check everybody, see if they're logged in. If, they're, if they are logged in, then we'll pick one at random and say, you know, here's the, here's the, the photo grid. Um, but if we, we luck out on all those, because you happen to have popped up in Australia and everybody's in bed in the UK, then we have your reference photographs, we can have two of them at the moment, not IP agents, um, uh, to show to the uh, organisation in question, you know, whether it's a front desk or something or a hotel or whatever, so they can have a fair idea of what you're supposed to look like. I mean, that's really the shortcoming we're trying to resolve. As I said, identity fraud all comes down to the fact that the organisations haven't even got a clue what you're likely to look like. Yeah. Um, actually, it's something you've just mentioned. But so the person who's going to identify you, if there are several online as such, it's a random choice on who's being picked. Yeah. There's no. No, we have to do it randomly because yeah. otherwise you can nobble referees. And we we try. We we actually have. Yeah, we enforce random selection of, of referees when it comes to okay. taking out references. And the more you have, then of course, you know, the more dissipated that can be. Have you ever have you thought about maybe having a consensus of referees as such? Yeah, I thought about that. Um, I'm not sure. Um, you know, we've got quite a long road ahead of us to figure out what how, how to tune this, and it could be quite a good idea to actually say, well, you know, we'll actually ask more people than one. <coughs> like today, when you do, when you use glass slipper, we send the photograph off to ten people to do the comparison. We take uh, we take you know, if if, if we've had five answers uh, that are all the same, then we go with that. We'll, we'll wait for all ten to come in. Um, so yeah, essentially we're, we're, we're mitigating for availability in that sense. Um, whether or not it's any more accurate is another matter because people say, uh, I'm often asked, you know, how many people do I have to have as my, as my identity referee on ID Angels in order to be a member? And we say, what? Because you only need one person to say, I don't know who the hell that is, to stop fraud. And that's the thing we're trying to do.